Good afternoon and welcome to Ask an Expert. Today, we're going to be focused on the four plus services. And we had asked get many questions around this and Mari is our resident expert, but um, uh, Kim also, this is her expertise. And so she's going to help unpack what that four plus service really means and how you qualify or you may not qualify for it. So thank you again, Kim, for joining us and finishing off our series for um, Ask Each Other Around Transition. So thank you, Kim. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, Kirsten Lane is not able to join us today, so you're um, going to hear all of your information from me today. She and I did work on the presentation together, but she had um, a family situation come up and she needed to take care of that. So um, the, this first slide, you may have seen it before if you were on one of our first webinars, but it, Kirsten and I both felt like it was really important um, to review this. You can see here, it says parents and families engaged in the transition planning and service delivery process and who express expectations their young person will work for competitive wages are associated with positive outcomes for young adults with disabilities. Other than the student or youth, their parents or other family members are the most critical to an individual's success during high school through the transition planning and service delivery process into their communities of learning, working, and living. So you might ask, how can you help? Attending this webinar is a great way to get started, but just being involved in your students' um, education process, the transition planning, all of those things, being engaged, setting high expectations for your students and providing opportunities for them to learn self-determination and self-advocacy skills throughout their um, schooling are great ways to um, get the ball rolling in the right way. Um, so the next several slides are a review if you've attended our other sessions. So I'm gonna go through those fairly quickly. If you were unable to attend one of those sessions um, the past two weeks, the recordings of those can be found on the YouTube channel, on Ask's YouTube channel. So the review of the transition basics. Transition planning begins at age 14 in the state of Iowa. Um, these are based on age appropriate transition assessments. And then there's ongoing development and refinement of transition planning th throughout the student's high school career. Transition planning is not something that should be waited um, to start until a student's senior year. There are just way too many um, pieces and parts that need to be um, discussed and thought through um, as your student is in high school. So all of your students' needs can be addressed in a whole bunch of different ways and in many different locations. And keep in mind that no one answer is right for every student. If you have multiple kids of your own, you know that what is good for one is not necessarily good for another one. And that's no different whether the child has a disability or doesn't have a disability. Um, these are the things a quality transition IEP includes um, these very different things. So transition assessments help to determine the student's needs, interests, and preferences. Those things that are transition assessments should be connected to the student and to their plans after high school. Quality assessments are designed by looking at the student's post-secondary expectation. You'll see me call it later a PSE because that's really a mouthful, post-secondary expectation, and determining what, what skills a student already has and what gaps they might have that we need to work on so that um, those skills can be built up and help the student get ready for their next environment. The goals and services for each of the transition areas, living, learning, and working, are aligned to the results of the transition assessments. And then, as I said earlier, connected to those PSEs. If there is not a need, if there is a, an area um, that the student doesn't need any work on, 
we're just going to document that. We're going to say student doesn't have any um, needs in the area of living, for example. Um, I'm going to back up one bullet there for a second. The goals are the areas, the goals of the student's IEP will be those areas in which the student needs specially designed instruction in order to gain the skills that they need. Um, the course of study for your student should align to the transition assessments as well as the PSEs. And then the linkages to the student's next environment um, that could be those linkages could be to IVRS. They could, I'm sorry, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services. They could be linked to the Iowa Department of the Blind, to disability services on a college campus. Could be that they need long-term supports through an adult service agency. All of those things should be outlined, but those again are going to help your student get from where they are now to the needs that they may have as an adult and help them reach their PSEs. And then your um, transition IEP or your transition plan um, should really include a plan for data collection and progress monitoring. So um, transition assessments should include information about the student from multiple sources people, uh, the, their teachers or um, whoever is working with them should interview them, the student themselves for sure. They're gonna to talk to family members. They're gonna to talk to teachers, maybe their special education teacher as well as a general education teacher. Maybe if they are involved in the community or something like that, they might wanna know about that student from a different perspective. There'll be formal and informal assessments um, so you can have some, some different perspectives there. And IVRS or Voc Rehab can assist with assessments that are related um, to employment. Um, in a couple of the previous sessions that Kirsten and I did, we talked about the Iowa transition model and that can help walk through some of this um, as far as the planning goes. There's a link to that document in both, I believe in both of the other webinars, which will be posted, as well as um, you can find that document if you go to the secondary transition page of the Department of Education website. So um, those are some good resources. Um, the results of the assessments should, as I said earlier, should be used to create and inform the goals and services that are connected to your student's PSE and they will assist in the development of the transition services. So when it comes to IEP decisions, um, IEP team decisions, excuse me, all of the placement decisions are made by the IEP team, not by one specific person. However, if there's one, one person that has a pretty strong opinion about what needs to happen next or, um, has some suggestions to make, I would really encourage you to make sure that that person gets invited to your student's IEP team meeting if that is a person other than you as the parent or family member. Um, we need to determine all of the student's uh, needs and then determine how and where those needs will be met. We don't decide on the location first, we decide what's needed first and then where it makes the most sense to um, have that, that need fulfilled. And then once a decision is reached, it can't be changed without another IEP meeting. The IEP meetings can be called at any time by anyone on the team. So it doesn't mean you have to wait for a year. It just means that if you've decided that your student is gonna receive services at a specific location and you start that and it's not working out and you've given it some time and the data isn't showing um, that it's being successful, then you call another IEP team meeting and have the discussion about that and, and look at alternatives as to where those things can happen. Decisions about placement for services and supports should be included in the prior written notice so that everyone is aware of the discussions that have happened and what the discussion was about, what decision was reached and why that decision was reached. 
So you're, the PWN will list all of the different um, options that were considered and then why the decision was either accepted or rejected based on the discussion with the IEP. So one of the things here that we really need to talk about is are four plus services needed? Because they're not for every student. But here are some of the things that can be used to inform the need for the students um, for, for four plus services. So the student's present level of academic achievement and functional performance or the PLAF, that is an awful thing to try and say. Those letters shouldn't be in order because they, they don't pronounce well. Um, the results of a student's transition assessments the student's post-secondary expectations, and then the student's status within the course of study. So we've talked about this before when we talked about graduation. What are the graduation assign, uh, um, requirements for the district that your student attends, and how does that align to their PSE? So one of the things we need to be really cognizant of here when we're talking about a PSE, if your student is planning to go to college, be it a community college, be it a um, four-year college or university, you need to be very aware that there are different entrance requirements for different schools. So just because your student has met the entrance requirements to get into, say, the University of Northern Iowa, that doesn't necessarily mean that he or she would have met all of the requirements to get into the University of Kansas. So you need to take a look at all of the entrance requirements for any school they are considering and ensure that while your student is still in high school, that they are doing everything that they can to meet the expectations to get into whatever college or university they are hoping to attend. Um, you can't wait to do this until there's their senior year because maybe, I used this example, I think, last week. Um, let's say that one of the colleges they want to attend has a requirement for a student to have four years of foreign language. Well, if you don't start talking about that till their junior year, there's no way they will have four years to get that much foreign language done ahead of time. So again, high expectations, set the bar as high as you think you want it to go, work towards that because it's a whole lot easier to back it down than it is to try and raise it um, at the end. Um, the discussions related to four plus services should begin at the same time as transition planning. Okay, so as soon as um, your kiddo enters high school, this should be something that is being discussed no final decision is gonna be made at that time because where your student is as a freshman and where they are as a senior are two very different things. Their um, PSE may change. They may gain a whole bunch of skills um, in that time from their freshman year to their senior year, but you don't wanna wait until that last minute to have this discussion. Chances are the decision won't be made until their senior year. If in fact, four plus services are determined to be needed, but don't wait to have the discussion at that time. It should be revisited every year. Um, and that um, should just be part of the, the IEP team meeting. So um, Kirsten and I have shown these before. These are located on the Department of Ed website under secondary transition, but these might be some things that could help in um, making some decisions. So we're going to look, let's look at the working one. I think we've done the learning one multiple times. So give me a second here. So you see it's on the secondary transition page and there are um, two of these. So they're on the page prior to this on the DE website, there is one that looks just like it, but it says working, or excuse me, it says learning. This is the working um, one. So this will talk about different things about um, successful employment outcomes, what that looks like, what the student's post-secondary expectation is, 
And these are, there's a whole list of things with a lot of links here about things to consider throughout high school. Again, you don't wanna wait till senior year. You wanna start these discussions. These are things that teachers can look at. You as family members can look at, your student can look at all sorts of links about pre-employment transition services, links to VR, links to IDB, workforce development, talks about um, apprenticeship programs, um, four plus services, senior year plus, and then it gives you some examples. Kim, so it you, talks, sorry, Kim, uh, the, sure. the screen is white. Oh, well, darn it. Let me see, let me stop share and reshare. Sometimes that works. Thank you. Okay, you bet. Thanks for letting me know, Deb. Kirsten like showed off last week and hers worked. Okay, let's see, how about this? Now, can you see it? Yes, yeah, so maybe uh, touch on that again. Yep, absolutely. So this is the working decision guide and it, talks about what shows up as in, in the big scheme of things, um, what we consider to the targets for successful employment. And then it talks about what the PSE is. Here is the page that had all of the links. So there's pre-employment pre transition services or pre VR, waiver funding, if your student might qualify for that, IDB, um, here are registered apprenticeship programs, so on and so forth. And then these are all things, again, don't wait to have these discussions or look at this information till your student's senior year. Start looking at this stuff early and often to see what else you can add to your student's toolbox. So then down here, these are actual like examples, right? So if it says, for example, it says your student's skills in relation to their PSC. So if they have the necessary academic, social, and behavioral abilities to get and keep a job and move forward in that career, you would graduate. There's no need for your student to um, get involved with four plus services. But here are some different things that might talk about the different gaps that your student might have and different ways to fulfill those. So those are just some good places for you to take a look. Try and, and read these um, examples or these uh, descriptions and see where your student fills it, fits in and then take a look at some possible decisions. These were not meant to be the end all be all for the answers um, for your student, but these are good places for families and educators to start a discussion about what's right for um, the specific student. Okay, now I'm going to do the stop, share, reshare. I apologize for that, but it didn't work otherwise. So I'm going to do that again and get back to the PowerPoint, I think. Well, it's just not being cooperative right now. I apologize. Here we go. Okay, let me... Now I'm gonna reshare. All right. Okay, Deb, can you see it again? Yes, we're good. Okay. All right, thank you. Sorry about that, technical difficulties. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what four plus services are. Okay, so they're secondary services. That means they are part of your student's public education, all right? They're used to um, fulfill unmet needs that are identified in the student's IEP. They're provided through the district's continuum of services of which four plus is on that continuum. They can be located in a variety of settings. For some students, there might be um, additional work that needs to happen within their home high school. It could be that there is another location within the school district that provides four plus services. It could be that if the, the student's PSE is um, employment, maybe the four plus services are happening in the community. 
or it could be that um, the four plus services are happening on a community college campus. One thing I really need to point out, as I said, these are secondary services, meaning they're part of the public school system. That means that your student cannot have graduated from high school if they're going to participate in four plus services. Now, they can take part in all of the graduation ceremonies, the parties, all of the things that go along with graduation. But if they accept a diploma or a certificate, they have exited special education at that time and they would no longer be eligible for four plus services. So that's the definition of what four plus services are. Now we're gonna take a look at what they are not. So it's not specifically a college program, it's not only located on a college or a community college campus. It's not a decision that is made by one person. Can't be provided to students who have graduated. It's not um, something that can be predetermined as to the length of time the student will participate. And it's not provided for the purpose of a student earning a post-secondary credit, a certificate, or a degree. So that means four plus services are based on unmet transition needs that come out through the transition assessments we talked about earlier. Goals, all of those things are written to um, help close the gap from where the student is currently to where their post-secondary expectation wants to take them. And it could be that your student needs just a little bit of help to get over the hump in going from the public school setting to a community college setting. Maybe one semester, things are going well, they can move on, they can exit and move on. It could be that it takes longer than that. Again, there is not a set amount of time and there is not a degree or something like that that is the goal of receiving four plus services. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a couple different scenarios here. So here's a living scenario. The student has unmet needs in the area of living. So they need assistant in, assistance in independent living skills, such as cooking, taking care of personal hygiene needs, handling a personal budget any of those types of things. Where can those things happen? They could happen, um, some options could be that the school district or the LEA provides specially designed instruction to assist in obtaining these skills. They could have four plus services on a community college campus. They might have assistance in a, in a dorm situation. I will tell you that most community colleges do not have dorms for their kiddos. Most times kids live in apartments that are kind of associated um, with the community college. And um, so that takes a different skill level than if they were living in a dorm with a resident assistant or an RA kind of right on hand there. Um, another way that um, their needs for living could be met is through a supported community living or SCL option where the student's going to live when they're done. So here's my plug here for, it's really important to start working with your student at a really young age. And Mari has a great transition map um, on the ASK website or on the Iowa transition website that will help with this. But um, there's all sorts of things, cooking, laundry, budgeting, hand handling medical needs, making their own appointments, knowing how to take medication, all of those things. The more of those things you can help your student with while they're still living at home, the more successful they will be when they are not living at home. All right, so now we're going to talk about a learning scenario. So let's say the student has unmet needs in a specific academic area or areas, reading, math, something like that. Where can those needs be met? Again, multiple options here. So it could be that the school provides specially designed instruction to assist in obtaining the skills. The LEA could provide additional academic instruction. 
four plus services on a community college campus could provide instruction and services to assist the student in making that transition from um, the high school to the college campus. Now, um, four plus services can help with things like study habits, organization, um, things like that. One thing you really need to be aware of is that special education, as you have known it throughout the public school system, does not look the same as what happens on a college, community college or a college campus, because realistically, there is no special education on college campuses. Um, your student, if they choose to go that route, they are gonna need to complete the same assignments as every other student in the class. They're going to need to take the same tests as everyone in the class. Um, they're gonna have the same expectations as everyone else in the class. The best way I can think about um, explaining that is that if, if you have two people that are working for the same degree or certificate, the university, the college or university needs to ensure that those two people, when they graduate, have the same skill set. So you can't have one person that only takes half a test. You can't have one person that um, gets to cross out a whole bunch of things on their test because those they need to happen in the same way. Now, the other thing to keep in mind though is that college campuses, be it community college or college university, four-year colleges or university, there are um, all sorts of assistance on campus that are available to all students. There are math labs, there are reading labs, there are writing labs, and it's going to be up to your student to figure out where they can access those services, how do they have to access those services. They're not going to have a case manager or a teacher at the next level to help them find those things. So again, that's where self-determination, self-advocacy, all of those things come into play so that they know how to find those things, who to ask when they have a question, all of those kinds of things. So those are the self-determination and self-advocacy skills are super important. And it will just make your child more or your student more independent as they get older, which um, I, is the goal for every parent. Um, to get them as independent as they can possibly be. All right, final scenario here is a working scenario. So the student might have unmet needs in the area of working. They've never had a job. They haven't explored different kinds of employment. So where can those needs be met? Again, their school district or their LEA might have some work experience opportunities they can work with your students on. Um, four plus services on a community college campus could provide training related to the career of the student's choice. Or the LEA, the school district, could um, contract with a community resource program or CRP or connect with IVRS or IDB to help fill those situations. And keep in mind, this was at the bottom of every slide in blue, and I didn't really say it, but these are things, um, and this, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are things that the IEP team should consider all of these various options and then make the best decision that fits um, that specific student and their PSE. And again, these discussions, whether it's living, learning, or working, should be discussed annually at the student's IEP meeting. And it should be that, as I said earlier, at any point in time, it could be determined by the IEP team that the student has met, has, has gotten the skills they need to fill the gap for that unmet transition need that started the four plus service discussion and the student can be exited at that point in time. All right, so we're gonna talk about what might four plus services look like in a high school setting. So we're gonna talk about the various settings and all the different things that could be um, offered at it, different 
locations. So keep in mind again, just like I said previously, this is not an exhaustive list. It's just a list to help you get started with the discussion. So um, they might, the school might offer direct instruction related to the gaps in skills. Um, be that primarily when I think of that, I think of more the academic type needs, but it could be anything in living, learning and working. Self-advocacy skills, schools can definitely work on that, but as families, you have a lot more opportunity and a lot more um, ways to offer your student um, the ability to grow in those areas. Um, schools can provide academic skills to prepare for post-secondary. That could be um, kind of related to their um, course of study on an annual basis. And they've determined it's filling the gap and making sure that they have the academic skills sets that they need to get into um, the college or university of their choice. Executive functioning, that is being able to plan their time. Do they use their time well? Do they know how long it will take to complete a, a specific activity? Do they have a good way of keeping track of the things that are required of them, assignments? Um, you know, how do they do that? There's a multitude of different ways. And I bet if every one of us on the call here um, shared how we organize ourselves, we probably each have a system that is just a little different from someone else. So some of us do things on our phones. We have, we use electronic calendars. Some people do better if they write things down. Some people do a combination of the two. It doesn't really matter. And you might have to, as I have, um, I've messed around with that a little bit. I've tried different things and found that one works better than another. And I just keep trying to hone it in so that I know um, where I'm supposed to be and what time so I don't miss a meeting or anything like that. Um, your high school might offer community education classes. Um, it could be that they talk to students about employability skills, being on time, um, completing tasks in a timely manner. Punctuality is a really important um, thing to start having conversations with your student. Many people lose their jobs because they show up late or because they don't show up and they forget to call, even if they're sick, even if it's a legitimate reason, they're sick, something like that. Um, high schools might provide work exploration. They could do job tours. They could do volunteer opportunities, things like that. They might offer on the job training or they might link with adult agencies like IVRS or IDB. Here's what four plus services could look like in a community setting. That could be, again, the employability skills, same things as before, punctuality, completing tasks in a timely manner, um, off-campus experiences, just volunteering, doing job tours, having an orientation to the community. What does public transportation look like in the area where you live, if that's um, available? Again, self-advocacy skills, work experience opportunities, on-the-job training, internships, registered apprenticeships, and again, linkages with adult agencies. And then finally, these are some of the things, this is might be what four plus um, services look like on a community college campus. So maybe the student would get help with scheduling, with study habits, with the course content. Again, I wanna reiterate, the expectations for taking a class and receiving college credit are going to be the same for every student in the class. Now, with that being said, it could be if your student is um, gets very distracted in a large setting, it could be that they could take their test in a quiet setting. They might be able to go to a different room to take their test. They might have that opportunity in their high school. But again, this is where self-determination and self-advocacy take place. There's not going to be someone else to have that conversation with their college instructor, and they're going to have to seek that person out. How do I go about this? Is there paperwork I have to fill out? Where do I report for the test? 
What time do I report for the test? And things like that. Um, it could be that the um, four plus services um, that the folks in those places can help your student connect with the on-campus disability services. That is often where a student would go if they're gonna get extended time on a test, if they're going to take their test in a quiet setting. But again, those are things that have to be set up. Your student can't just show up and say, I'm here to take my math test because the service, um, the disability services may not have the um, necessary paperwork or might not have the, the test on hand, things like that. Self-advocacy shows up again here. What does that look like on a college campus? It looks a little bit different than in, than in high school. So um, in high school, they have a teacher or a case manager, someone that's probably following up with them or for them. So, but this is really gonna fall on your student. What does that look like? Again, linkages with adult agencies. Sometimes there are adult agencies right on the college campuses. Um, and the four plus service providers can help make those linkages. And it could be that um, the people in four plus can help with the course content that's specific to your student's PSE. For example, if they're interested in becoming a welder, they can help your student figure out what the welding program looks like, how they have to get that set up and um, what that's gonna look like in the long term. So here's three reasons to consider four plus services on a community college campus, okay? The first one is the student is gonna go on to college, but he or she needs the time in the actual setting to help with learning characteristics and generalization skills. Could be that the student's gonna go on to college, but they need to learn specific study habits or accommodation skills in that setting. It's one thing to talk about something, it's another thing to do it. So maybe they just need that little bit of help to make that step from their high school campus to a community college campus. The final reason might be that they might not be successful independently at a college setting, but with support, they can gain those specific career and technical skills that will eventually lead to a stronger employment outcome. So currently there are nine four plus programs across the state of Iowa. One pretty much in each of the nine AEAs or the nine regions of the state. Um, typically what happens if a student's gonna attend a four plus program, they often attend the one that is closest to where they live. Um, the, the one exception to that might be if they are wanting a very specific um, like employment type outcome and that program is not offered at the community college closest to them, then they might be able to attend one that is further away. But those are the nine um, programs that currently exist across the state. So I am, that is the end of the presentation part. So I will do my best to answer any questions. I see there's some questions in chat, but- um, are. Kim, you did a great job of unpacking that. So um, hopefully uh, families will be able to use that when they ask those questions um, as they're transitioning and making decisions for their kiddo of what's the best next. Um, we have a question. I understand that DMAX Drive program would be an example of a four plus service. Um, what do you call the option of University of Iowa REACH program? So I think there's two questions in there, Kim. Is that a four plus service on DMAC? And then about the, the um, Iowa City program, the yep. REACH program. Yep, absolutely. Uh, both DMAC programs, STRIVE and STRIVE Academy um, are both four plus programs. Um, you'd have to look at there. I haven't really investigated those programs recently to understand if they've made some changes and what the differences are, but they are both considered four plus programs. So I'm sure if you went to the DMAC website, you would find um, 
kind of a description of who they develop those different programs for and who might be most successful in one versus the other. The right. REACH program at the University of Iowa is a post-secondary program, meaning that your um, son or daughter will have graduated from high school and will go to the REACH program or there, there are programs very similar to the REACH program all over the country. Um, keep in mind though, that is going to be on your dime, meaning it would be just like um, your student without disabilities going to the University of Iowa. It's gonna be um, you paying for that versus um, the school as if, the, if your child is going into four plus services, the school is still um, responsible for the cost of that program. So I have another question. Would a student who is getting four plus services need to take any of the statewide standardized assessments or the alternative assessment? Um, I'm not sure. Are you talking about would they take the assessments when they're in when they're receiving four plus or prior to and actually i'll be really honest i don't know the answer to that okay but i'm so i would have to do i don't even want to venture yes, on that one because okay. i'm afraid that i will say it incorrectly so. okay all right if you could do some homework and let us know um that would be awesome so or you can yeah or you can have somebody um email me directly i did notice Kirsten and I did not put our contact information in this slide deck. Um, so, but it's on the other two slide decks. So um, if you need to reach out to either one of us, you can grab our contact info oh, on one point. of the others. Yep. I apologize. Yep. Um, we did have somebody clarify. I love, because this is a community of practice, basically. C clarification. So if a student attends a four plus um, community college option that the student cannot receive a certificate or diploma from that community college. This was no, that, somebody that from is Mosaic, not Mosaics. Accurate. That is not accurate. No, not necessarily. Um, what I was trying to point out with that was because it's a, if your student is attending a four plus program, they cannot accept their diploma or their certificate from their public high school because that would end their um, ability to receive special education services. Once a student accepts a diploma, special ed as you know it is, is complete. They can go through the graduation ceremony, they can go to the parties, they can do all of the things, they can walk across the stage, but if they take a signed diploma, a signed certificate, that is the end of their special education in the public school system. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, if an IEP team decides that a student should attend through age 21, how should that be documented on the IEP? It should never be determined that it's an automatic. This should be a discussion that happens every year Every year, the transition assessments should be updated. The uh, skills and gaps and in relation to the student's post-secondary expectation should be explored so that you can look at what unmet needs does this student have that they need to stay in school beyond age 18. It doesn't mean that it won't happen. It just means you don't make that decision when a student is 14. You don't make that decision when they're 16. It could be that when they're 18, you decide, you know what? They need some more services. So that would be part of the four plus, regardless of where it's happening. In the high school, in the community, on a community college campus, it could happen in any, any or all of those places. Then a year from that time, you're gonna have another IEP meeting. You're gonna have the discussion again. Do they still have unmet transition needs? What do those look like? What's their PSE? Are we getting closer to that? What does that look like? How are we gonna fill those gaps? So what I hear you saying is that it's um, not something that you can plan out for four years or three years or two years. 
it's based every year on that reevaluation, that mm -hmm. determination, their data, their growth, and what next steps are. Is what I hear you yeah, saying. Yeah, it could be, it could be the IEP IEP team's thought that a student would continue till twenty one, but a final decision should never be made that far in advance. Well, thank you so much for spending your noon hour with us with Ask Each Other. Thanks so much, Kim. It's very helpful, valuable information. So we appreciate that. Have a good rest Absolutely. of your day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.